Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the Lashing Out Podcast on the Nittany Sports Now Network. My name is Jared Prugar. I'm joined by Kevin Quigley and NSN's Joe Smelter. Gentlemen, Penn State got their bowl assignment. They're off to the Peach Bowl for the first time in program history, playing an opponent for the first time in program history in Ole Miss. And James Franklin and Lane Kiffin are facing off for the first time in their coaching careers. This has all, all the makings of a, of a great matchup which I think is exactly what Penn State fans wanted. We know very clearly that Penn State fans are greedy. They want to be elite. Beating a team that's at the top of the SEC, much like Ole Miss has been, uh, definitely does that. So right now, it's Penn State, Ole Miss, and Atlanta for the first time in history. What are your thoughts? I think I think my thoughts are I was, I was kind of hoping for maybe a Mizzou matchup. Uh, I thought that was probably – better matchup teams play similar style um mizzou and penn state do that is uh but old miss is it's going to be a challenge old miss is a prolific offense they have a defense that has a tendency to sometimes not show up um and if you're penn state it's you have the opportunity to go against a top 11 ranked opponent uh third or fourth place in the sec and it's a prove it game they what, what did Penn State do this year? They lost to Ohio State. They lost to Michigan. Michigan's number one, and Ohio State's number seven, I believe, in the most recent rankings, but obviously a team that had a shot to be in that Final Four, and Penn State was an offensive performance away from beating either of those teams. So can they put an offensive performance together on December 30th that shows, hey, like we deserve to be in that top eight, top ten, program in the country talk and you go to the peach bowl in atlanta for the first time in program history you face off against that top sec a uh, top sec program for this year and you prove that you deserve to be there yeah um i think this is uh pretty close to a perfect uh situation uh, for penn state uh to be in you know um reading the bowl projections i think uh by um early sunday morning and even into early sunday afternoon People were kind of thinking, um, okay, Penn State's either going to play Liberty or SMU, which especially Liberty would not have moved the needle at all, or they're going to play Georgia, in which case they'd either play the A team or in lo- in lose, excuse me, or uh, play or beat Georgia, but have it in the minds of, have it with an asterisk in the minds of a lot of people because Georgia would potentially have a lot of players drop out of that game. Uh, Ole Miss is, I don't think this can really be a statement game unless Penn State wins 35-10. I wouldn't go that far, but it's definitely a chance for Penn State to do what it hasn't had really any chances to do, and that's play a team that isn't a national championship caliber program, but also isn't a team that Penn State should automatically beat by two scores or more. I think it's that kind of perfect medium that's really been lacking partially because James Franklin intentionally does not schedule big time opponents out of conference and partially because the big 10 these days is very top heavy. Ole Miss is different from Penn State stylistically. I think obviously Penn State's known for its defense. As Kevin mentioned, Ole Miss is not known for that at all. They're known for scoring and that's going to make for kind of an exciting, uh, irresistible force and movable object uh, type of deals. But uh, this is Ole Miss is kind of a team that like Penn state um, hasn't really gone to that uh, second level. Uh, They're both in tough divisions, uh, SEC West, big 10 East. Um, And looking at this year, the two losses, it's kind of scary how similar, right? Uh, Penn state lost to a team that's in the playoff Michigan. And then a team that would have been in the playoff if it won one extra game. And that's Ohio state. Same with Ole Miss with Alabama and Georgia. So, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, kind of – I don't know if it's a chance for a statement, but it's definitely a chance much like Utah was last year where Penn State can play a team that isn't at the highest level but is at a level kind of even to where Penn State is. And Lane Kiffin said that there, as far as he knows, nobody is opting out. So it looks like we're getting Penn State's A team – or excuse me, Penn State's getting Ole Miss's A team. So if Penn State wins this one, there's not going to be – any asterisks is there. They're going to get Ole Miss at its best. And it's a chance to maybe not, definitely not flip the narrative entirely, but it's a chance to prove something at least. That's a really good point. You know, 
SMU and Liberty wouldn't have been great, but the good news, and I think this is the same in grace for Penn State, is they have played a group of five team in the last five years. They played them uh, in the Cotton Bowl when they just trounced Memphis, and Micah Parsons had his coming out party, and Journey Brown had his coming out party um, as well. So that that definitely helps. I think you know when you look at James Franklin and Lane Kiffin, both have spent time in the SEC. And it's it's hard to compare them now just because th- this game was, you know, obviously announced this afternoon on Sunday afternoon. And it was a wild morning um, or wild early afternoon for college football after a wild night. And we'll talk about that later in the podcast. But for Penn State now, they get to go to the Peach Bowl. They get to go to Atlanta. That's a decent trip that's not going across the country to the Rose Bowls, a place that they've been before, the Fiesta Bowl. You know, it's something new against a new opponent. Um, and against a team that that is a proven winner in the SEC of late, you know, and, and a little bit of, of the hilarity here, I think, in the, for a comic reason, you know, this is the Chad Powers Bowl. Uh, you've got <laughs> Eli Manning, who went to Ole Miss, and then obviously Chad Powers, who tried to walk on at Penn State. You know, I think that would be a kind of a unique situ- situation and set up to get involved here for the programs. But again, this for Penn State, the Peach Bowl, they're in the New Year Six once again. They get a good, they get a good opponent. Um, I don't know that they would have necessarily liked to get Georgia, um, a pissed off Georgia, um, yeah. much like Florida State is going to get a pissed off Georgia and a, a pissed off Florida State team, and honestly, rightfully so. But Penn State fans will be first to point out: 2016 conference champion Penn State didn't make the the playoff, though they weren't undefeated, but. You know, that's kind of the nature of the beast. And, and Joe mentioned the the scheduling of opponents, and and that's you know that's where we're at. That's the nature of college football. And why would you schedule a tough opponent when it's really your goal, like James Franklin has said, is to get to the end of the season undefeated? Yeah, and just to tie in more to the Eli Manning and Chad Powers, can, if uh, Penn State beats Ole Miss, can we, can we re-spell Jackson Dart's first name? If you don't know, it's J-A-X-S-O-N. Like, it just pisses me off. So just a lot of angst built up in me with the way that uh, his parents chose to spell his name. Yeah, that is one of the best names for a quarterback, though. Your last name is Dart. I mean, that it is. It is. It is, but I hate the, spell- I hate the spelling of the first name. Um, but, yeah, and, Joe, you said it wouldn't be a statement win. It wouldn't be a statement game, but it's a barometric game. Right. You, you, want, it, you want to have it as a gauge. Where do you stand? And you want to prove to the recruits that, like, no, this team is good. And if you look at the ESPN FPI, which is probably a bogus rating system anyways, it's Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State is the top three in the ESPN FPI. So Penn State hasn't been able to prove that on the field, that they are that top three to five program like the computers say that they are. I'd be interested to see what the BCS has the top four as because I know someone still does run that computer somewhere, um, somewhere, somehow. But it, you need to show that it's opening up as what a two and a half point game. I believe you had earlier today, Joe, they need to come out and win by two scores. It needs to be a 10, 10, 12 point game. And we'll preview it later. We're still a month out from there. So, but just for now, they need to come out, show that they can compete, show that they can actually dominate that sec program. Yeah. It's not Alabama or Georgia, but quite frankly, I don't think I'd want to play Alabama or Georgia right now. Georgia. No. And- George is argu- arguably one of the top four teams in the country, and Alabama definitely is as well. So, Mizzou or Ole Miss is that good to show that you know we're not quite in the top four, but we can win games against that the programs in the ranks five to ten, which is going to be important next year when we go to twelve teams. Yeah, and Jared, you mentioned Georgia uh, getting a pissed off Georgia. So I think you could get a pissed off Georgia in a bowl game, and you, or you could get an ap- apathetic Georgia with the mindset of all right, we're not in the playoff. Uh, why do we have any reason to give a shit? So even if you get that type of Georgia team and you beat Georgia, you're still going to have people saying, well, um, that they had nothing to play for. Uh, you were going full fraud. Oh, the other team was going 50% or less. Ole Miss, Ole Miss is going to be going, like, you're going to get the best Ole Miss, as I kind of alluded to earlier. And uh, we'll see. Um, James Franklin men- did not mention really anything about opt-outs, which – I wouldn't know. I wouldn't call it out a red flag, but I will say this: um, if I have my memory right, last season he said right away that there were going to be no opt outs for the Rose Bowl, aside from Joey Porter Jr., who announced that even before the bowl game was announced. 
Um, so that tells me, and I will see what happens. I can't confirm this at all, but that tells me maybe he has a pretty good idea that a few guys are going to sit out. And I would honestly expect that. I mean, the Peach Bowl is not the Rose Bowl. It's a big deal. Any New Year's Six game is a big deal, but it, it's not the granddaddy of them all. I think you're going to see um, Fashionu, Robinson, uh, Kalen King. I don't know if they'll all sit out, but I think – I don't think Penn State is going to be at 100% with its top talent. That's just my observation, early, early observation. It'll be very interesting to see how Penn State handles that. Typically, they don't get a lot of opt-outs. They don't really get that type of that type of decision. Now, Joey Porter Jr. Came, coming off injury, it paid off for him, obviously. But it'll be very interesting. And and, and Joe and I were on the, po- the, the Peach Bowl press conference today, the introductory press conference, which was Lane Kiffin and, and James Franklin, plus some of the reps uh, from the Peach Bowl. And it was, a, it was a, a unique experience. Now, do I think it was a little bit rushed? Yes, I, I absolutely do. Um, and the reason why is both of these guys are focused on recruiting, and this is something we'll talk about in the second segment. But they're both dealing with recruiting. They're dealing with the portal. They're dealing with the wrap-up of their season plus official visits. Um, James Franklin had just gotten on, like, just landed from a plane. So, I mean, it was a little thrown together. But, you know, it's still good to get that information out there in the open and, and things like that. But for me, I would much rather have done that later tonight um, or later Sunday night or, or even sometime during the week. Uh, just where coaches are have done a little bit more research. These coaches don't follow other teams during the season unless they end up on the coach's tape and they have a common opponent. Let's let's be real. They'll pass each other in recruiting circles. But other than that, there's not much familiarity. It's not like, hey, James Franklin's texting Lane Kiffin. Hey, what's up, man? Um, what are you going to do this week game plan wise? Or how, how what did you see? Or what are you doing? Or, or those types of things. So I think a little bit more time would have been very good. Um, for all involved, but at the same time, it's a it's an excellent experience for Penn State, and and maybe the allure of, of being the first team to ever f- win all six New Year's Six games is enough to to get guys to come back for one final game uh, in the blue and white. You know, that's one of those things. Yeah, sure, it's not the granddaddy of them all. It's not the playoff, but they do have something historic to to play for. No, and it is Mer- Mer- the new Mercedes Benz Superdome in Atlanta. So it's a cool stadium to play in. Maybe guys do want to play there. Um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. And probably something we can also talk about in the third segment as, as we get to more of the overarching structure of college football. Why do you do this on Sunday at noon right before NFL kicks off? Like the NFL is king. Like every, every league avoids the NFL. The NFL says, I want to play a game on this day. Every league says, I'm not playing games on that day. Look at an NHL slate. Look I mean, at the NBA. college – College football pretty much said today that they don't really give a shit about what people think, you know. They did, but like so they are very stubborn and they will go up against no everybody, and, no matter what. Yeah, and you even could probably, you could probably strike a, a deal with. Hold on, let me, let me, you could probably strike a deal with the NFL to not have a Monday night football game this week and do a Monday night primetime special of releasing the college football playoff, and then you dominate the market on Tuesday on Sports Talk Radio and Sports Talk in general. You'd have to strike a mega deal with the NFL to do that, but that's something that could happen. But, of course, the NCAA doesn't have a spine and doesn't have proper plans. This isn't the NCAA. This is a college football playoff. This in ESPN. Yeah, but it, it is, but overarching governing body could step in and say something. Right. And the playoff the playoff at noon is not smart, but the rest of the bowl games at 2 o'clock in the middle of all the 1 o'clock games, that's worse, I think. So... Well, what's worse is if we were to continue this first segment, but we've got plenty more to talk about Penn State football-wise when we come back from the lashing uh, from this break on the Lashing Out podcast on the Nittany Sports Now Network. Welcome back to the second segment of the Lashing Out podcast on the Nittany Sports Now Network. I'm Jared. There, Kevin and Joe, gentlemen. Penn State before the New Year's Six bowls were announced made a splash of news earlier this week when they hired a new offense of coordinator, Andy Kotelnicki out of Kansas. Great hire. In my opinion, he's got the opportunity to really build a new offense to fit the personnel, which is something that James Franklin has specifically said he wanted to do ever since he fired Mike Yurcich in the middle of the season. So that to me speaks volumes to what Kotelnicki is going to be able to do offensively with these personnel. And 
I'm excited to see some of these options. I was looking at um, some plays uh, for Kansas and, and even Buffalo when he was there. Buffalo gave Penn State fits a couple of years ago when they played at Beaver Stadium. This, I think, has all the makings of being a home run hire. He's not a, he was not a big name. People did not think that he was going to leave Kansas, but Penn State backed up the brink truck to keep him or to get him to Happy Valley. I'm, I'm speaking ahead and hoping that they do the same thing with Manny Diaz, but offensively speaking, they've got their guy, and I think Penn State fans should be pretty excited for this. Yeah, and Jared, you know I was excited about Kansas football all season long until Jalen Daniels got hurt, which was week four. I did not play in this fit in uh, Kansas's fifth game of the season. Jason Bean takes over as a backup quarterback, loses his first game and then three more games. So they kind of got to the meat and potato of their schedule. But the Kansas offense was still productive with Jason Bean, who is, I think, a six year senior at this time this season. Kansas is a mid level Big 12 program at best. Texas and Oklahoma are recruiting the hell out of their backyard. And Kansas football talent it's a small state let's be real it's the midwest it's it's not it's sparsely populated you're not you don't have the most dense talent pool to pull from penn state is is in the northeast they're in the mid-atlantic he's going to be able to recruit this area well and i'm excited for how he's going to do it because i the the number one thing i'm excited about is he said somebody came out with it that Every Sunday, what he does is he watch every other team's explosive plays and sees how he can scheme up the same thing. He is not complacent, and Penn State has suffered from complacency with Mike Yersich for the last three seasons. And they seems like they've got a guy who has a lot of experience. I think he's been OC since what 2006, and he's hasn't missed a beat. He hasn't stopped innovating. Yeah. Uh... So I'll take this time to address uh, kind of the skepticism slash criticism I received, I've seen from this hire. Uh, the one big thing um, I've seen, and there aren't, there aren't too many people uh, that are critical of uh, the Andy Cole and Nicky hire. I think it's pretty universally acclaimed among uh, Penn State fans and the college football world. But um, I do see a lot of people saying uh, – that this guy came from the Big 12 and using that as a knock. I think that that is crap because Kansas, uh, as far as I know, was in the Big 12 before 2021 and was one of the worst offenses in college football. I'm reading Pro Football Focus in 2020, um, there were three teams, UConn, UMass, and I forget the other one. Those were the only three teams that had a lower offensive rating than Kansas. And then even the first season that Colonel Nicky was there, it was one of the worst offenses in America, and he – progressively got it better and now it's almost overnight it seemed it became one of the best and even without Jalen Daniels this for a large portion of this season nine games it's been pretty darn good so the big 12 you, you could use that for guys like uh what to say it, Mike Yersich who came from Oklahoma State where he was working with Mike Gundy and walked into a great situation you can't use that for a guy winning at Kansas as good as a coach as Leopold is um if you're an offensive coordinator making Kansas a top 10 team offensively you're doing something right the second knock and this i think is a little more reasonable i really can't fault people for thinking this way is that there's a mindset that some people have of well we got really excited for mike yurcich and that didn't work out i don't want to get my hopes up for this guy and i get it we're only a few weeks removed from this guy being in the job i get not wanting to really uh dive on in that that makes a lot more sense but um yeah i'm a big believer in that if you're whenever you're hiring anybody, you want the next person you hire to be completely different from the guy that he's replacing, whether that's personality wise, whether that's coaching style wise, whatever. And I think the Penn State did that here. I think that um, Mike Yurcich was a guy that had coached at multiple Power Five schools: Ohio State, Texas, and Oklahoma State. I don't know if I'm missing any, but he coached there, so he was pretty polished. And this guy, I think. Uh, Colonel Nicky is a guy that I think is experienced enough to where you know a lot of what he can do, but also an up-and-comer in the sense to where he isn't a guy that's been bouncing around the Power Five for years. And there's a bit of mystery there of like, okay, you know, this guy was at Kansas where the resources are nowhere near where they are with a borderline blue, but what, like Penn State, what's he going to do when he gets to five, these five-star 
high end four star guys. Mike Yersich was already at places where he had those guys, so there was less mystery there. I think um, scheme wise, this guy is great. I w- we'll talk more about that. I think resume wise, he's done a great job at two places where it's pretty hard uh, to have success, and um, there's enough mystery here where you can kind of you know what he can do but he can also get excited of seeing what he can do when he has a lot more opportunities to work with the drew hours of the world so it's i'll i'll join the party i think it's a very good to great hire and he's not mike yersich and no disrespect to mike yersich but i think this is a lot different of a situation than mike yersich was and the people that are concerned about this being yersich 2-0 I, I don't think that's going to happen with Kittle Nicky. No, he's he's a seemingly loyal guy, very loyal to Lance Leopold, and and they've done it. They did a great job at Kansas. Kevin alluded to it. They they did not miss a beat when Jaden Daniels went down or Jalen Daniels, I should say. But that that was huge. Um, you know, two QB system. That's something that James Franklin has been in love with since he got to Penn State. Uh, it's something that, you know, sometimes I think Penn State fans want to beat themselves, beat their heads off a wall because of it. Um, but I'm, I'm more interested to see what this does to the rest of the staff. He was not a dedicated, technically a dedicated position coach, although he oversaw tight ends um, at Kansas. And and they do have – it'll be interesting to see how they finagle some of the staffing um, to see who's going to be working with quarterbacks and, and the like. But this, on the surface, seems like a very good hire. The best thing that they did was hire him now. He is going to be with them throughout bull prep, throughout the rest of the recruiting cycle and the portal, portal cycle as well. And I think that is that right there is the most important thing. Yeah, he's not he's going to be involved in game planning and, and certain things, but he is more of an advisor, much like Manny Diaz was when he saw when he was hired by Penn State. Um, as well. So this is going to give them a great opportunity to get him, get him, get his feet wet. And James Franklin mentioned this during the press conference today, um, or I guess should say the zoom, but he, he's like, yeah, he gets to, gets to be immersed and see how he thinks, how things go, how they do things. He won't be out recruiting with Kansas paraphernalia on much like Taylor Stubblefield did when he had the U belt. So, you know, there's a great opportunity uh, for him to get acclimated to the program, to the area, less stress there um, and be around for bull prep in the, in those developmental practices. And I think that is very huge for Penn state moving forward. Yeah. Prep. Another th- one last thing about just his history. He was with Lance Leopold from 2013 at Wisconsin whitewater, followed him to Buffalo and then followed him to Kansas. So this guy is very loyal. Penn state comes in back to bring start up. Like Joe said, like Audrey Snyder reported and, Franklin's able to woo him away. So hopefully this is a guy, hopefully like Manny Diaz, that Penn State has pillars now. They have a pillar at head coach. Hopefully they have a pillar on DC. And hopefully they have a pillar at OC. And they can build up coaching stability. And that's one thing Penn State has not had. Um, and that hopefully this is, we're ushering in a new era of college football coaching stability, which is really unheard of. And yeah, Jared, like you said, just how Manny Diaz watched Andy po- and Anthony Poindexter uh, be the DC interim DC when he was hired. Kotal Co- Nicky's probably going to do is going to do the same thing as be a shadow to Howell and Cider, and hopefully, you know, maybe he's able to put a little bit of flavor on it. Maybe he's able to identify where Penn State struggled to run the ball because Kansas was, I think, eighth in the country in rushing offense this year. Granted, it was in the Big Twelve, but Kansas doesn't have the offensive line that Penn State does, and if hopefully Fashnu stays and plays in the bowl but hopefully he's able to like put a little bit of flavor on this on this cider and Howell offense to improve it because i think they will need an improved offense performance against Ole miss to win and um if anything he's going to get familiar with the players and once spring ball comes around in march late february early march like this team's going to be ready to go and he's going to have a relationship with the incoming recruits the current players and hopefully get a good traction on the next recruiting cycle because it's, it's college football. You got to re recruit your roster every year and you got to bring in 25% of your roster from out of high school. who have never played college ball before in their life. So um, it was really important that they got this hire done and I'm, I'm excited for it. 
Yeah, Kevin, you mentioned the uh, Cuddle Nicky uh, every Sunday watching um, other games and getting ideas of how to make these explosive plays happen. I think that's really important because um, – I know I'm not trying to slander Mike Yursich, but there was a vibe, I think, that this was a guy who felt that was so committed to what that what he was doing was the right way and didn't really, frankly, didn't really listen to anybody else. I think uh, in the, the day after Yursich was fired, Franklin had his weekly press conference, and he didn't say this flat out, but he kind of implied that Yursich during the Michigan game kind of went rogue and what the plan that the offensive staff had come out uh, with during the week, that wasn't really followed um, on game day. He James Franklin implied that. And he's talked about in the days and weeks after that, the offensive staff had more collaboration with Jay one Sider and Ty Howe running the show. And I think James Franklin wants collaboration. And the fact that Cuddle Nicky spent all this time watching, um, whatever offensive coordinators were doing and probably guys he had never met before. That kind of tells me that this is a guy that is going to take input from the staff, work with the staff, and he'll he'll be the main guy in charge of running the offense, but he's going to listen to um, ideas uh, from the rest of the offensive staff because Penn State's offensive staff, these guys know what they're doing. And um, assuming Jay Wan Sider and Ty House say, which I think they will, we don't know, but I, there's nothing that really says that they won't. Those are two good guys uh, to have on staff and two guys that will have the added experience of coaching as offensive coordinators in two and probably three games, assuming that they keep the system in place for the bowl game. And those are guys that are their input is going to be valued, I think, uh, with Cole and Nicky on staff. And I don't know if that's something that was there with Mike Yurzich. And I think that's pretty important because I think the defensive staff does a great job of getting their heads together and creating the number one total defense in America. The offensive staff maybe didn't have that as much. And I think next season, uh, that's going to change. That's a really good point. You know, you, we mention all the time about, you know, everybody working together in three phases, complimentary football, but complimentary football works in coaching as well. And you, you have to have that cohesion. And I never really got that your stitch was that guy. I, you know, especially, you know, with some of the things that, that he has said, you know, talking about hype, talking about certain things and the, the writing was on the wall for your such as well. I mean, you know, Penn state had the same game plan to game and for, for both Ohio state and Michigan, and they didn't change anything. And it was far from the same game plan that they had against literally any other team. Now, don't get me wrong. That's comparing apples to oranges, but you got to mix it up. And, you know, after after the Michigan game, lightning doesn't strike twice. And and it um, it's just one of those one of those deals. But, you know, Koto Nikki is very far down on the totem pole, you know, when it comes to the how the rest of this week was and this weekend was in college football. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we come back for the third and final segment of the Lashing Out podcast and the Nittany Sports Now Network. Welcome back to the third and final segment of the Latching Out Podcast on the Navy Sports Now Network. I'm Jared, and I'm here with the fake Jonas Brothers, Joe and Kevin. Gentlemen, it was a wild weekend of football. The conference championships games were everything that we expected and more. Iowa got shut out, which now, if I am not mistaken, they were shut out by the two ranked teams that they have played, and I believe it was either by 56 or 57 points. That is Iowa football in a nutshell. And I'm here for it. Of course, that means that Michigan won. Michigan, by way of Georgia getting beat by Alabama, ended up falling out of the top four, making way for Michigan to be the number one seed, getting a date with Alabama, who jumped an undefeated conference champion to face. Uh, and then you've got Texas. Are they back? Maybe. But... It was such a wild weekend. You've had SMU beat Tulane. You had Liberty beat New Mexico State uh, in the CUSA championship. But everything almost that could have gone chaotically went chaotically. And, oh, Florida State's undefeated and missed the playoffs. Yes. Florida State misses the playoffs. And for one uh, first reason. Of all, wait, 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 wait. Sorry to interrupt you. How satisfying was that for you to see them not make the playoff? Because I know you have been down on Florida State all year. I mean, deservedly so, because Florida State stinks. Florida State is not a good team. They have a really good defense. Jordan Travis, when he is their quarterback, 
He is a good quarterback. He is competent. But they are in the ACC. The ACC had a down year. Yes, the ACC had a better record versus the SEC than the SEC had against the ACC this year. But Florida State played LSU in week one. No team is at its best in week one. LSU is a much better team right now. And I bet you if you give LSU a rematch, even with a healthy Jordan Travis, LSU is probably going to probably going to whip their ass. And Florida State did not get in the playoff, not for what they accomplished. It's for what Alabama accomplished and for what you said in the first segment, the ESPN college football playoff. ESPN, there's no way in hell the SEC champion does not get in. The SEC and the Big Ten have been represented in every college football playoff that has happened so far. This is the 10th one. Big Ten and SEC makes it. The other three conferences, hopefully you can get in. It's the same reason Penn State didn't get in in 2016. Ohio State got in with a backup quarterback in 2014. But why? Because Cardell Jones threw for like 252 yards and three touchdowns on 17 attempts. Florida State barely got 16 points against Louisville on on Saturday night. And I think they scored, what, three points in the first half or six points in the first half. Like, that team is awful without Jordan Travis. And does it suck that they went 13-0 and and won their conference and were undefeated? Yeah. But in the 14 playoff, the curse of the 14 playoff is that one Power 5 conference champion does not make it. The ACC is the weakest conference this year. Their champion gets set at home. The Big 12s missed out when they were the weakest conference and they had an undefeated conference champ. No, they were not undefeated. Was it one loss Baylor? One yes. loss Yeah, one loss Baylor. They got jumped. They got jumped in the last week after after championship. The Pac 12s had to miss out a couple of years because the Pac 12 was down and down and out for a few years. So we didn't really have a lot of controversy with them. But what a way for the final college football 14 playoff to go out. It should have been six all along. I think 12 is probably going to dilute it just a little bit, but this is, this is what they wished for 10 years ago is chaos. And well, what a way for it to go out. Just think we're not talking about any of this. If Auburn stops a fourth and goal from the 31 yard line, but uh, yeah, the Florida state thing, that's, that's polarizing as hell. I, I see both ends of it. I, I do not, I don't know how anybody can think that Florida State is one of the best four teams in the country, especially without Jordan Travis. With Jordan Travis, I don't know if they were. I don't think I'm as down on them as Kevin um, is. But without Jordan, Jordan Travis, not one of the four best teams. One of the four most deserving teams, that's a different argument. I think you could definitely make that argument. But the issue I have is that since when, why did the college football playoff decide this season that it was best and not most deserving? They might have been, they might think that that's what they've been doing for the past 10 years, but Cincinnati was one of the four best teams in 2021. Um, I don't think by the end of the 2016 season that Ohio State was a better team than Penn State, the way uh, Penn State was playing. I don't know if, even though they won a game, I don't know if TCU was one of the four best teams last year, but they all got in because uh, the committee showed um, that it valued res- uh, winning the games you play and not style points. And this year, uh, they clearly decided, in fact, they didn't try to hide it at all, that um, it comes down to what teams are going to have the best chance come what's going on right now and the circumstances and what would happen in would Alabama or Florida State get Michigan a better game uh, and all that. So um, I I see both sides of it. Um, I'm not as – I would have probably put Florida State in. I'm not adamant about it the way people are. If people disagree with it, I I definitely see that because they're not one of the four best teams. What I don't like is the inconsistency of it all because the committee has never really done it that way in the past so why they decided all of a sudden that this year they're gonna do it that way um i just don't like the inconsistency of it that's my thing and that's been the problem in its entirety is the consistency is 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 it the most deserving team well every team that is competent should deserve to play for the playoff penn state could have easily made that argument they lost to two of the best teams in the country 
So, you know, everybody deserves or things they deserves. And, and yeah, that's that's human nature. But it's the best teams. Alabama's playing some excellent football. They looked really good against Georgia. Of course, Nick Saban's very familiar with Georgia and Kirby Smart. And playing in that moment, and that matters. The Florida State has not looked great. The ACC, as Kevin alluded to, is not great this year. Clemson is down. You know, it, it's just one of those situations where it, they are a product of a disaster. And now, how do you have confidence in the ACC? You know, if you're Florida State and you're already th- contemplating leaving and exiting the, the, the league, I'm on my way out now because they, sh- they show that the ACC is not strong. You know, it, with the 12-team playoff, now we're going to be seeing, oh, who's going to be the 9-3 and team battling for 12-13th and 13th rather than why is Florida State an undefeated conference champion and they're not out? Listen. I the one thing that I hate about this is that they they blamed it on his ankle injury. They blamed it on Jordan Travis's ankle injury, and I don't think that's fair. I don't think to come out here and say something that ended this guy's season, despite what Florida State was able to do after, you know, they they should not have come out and said that. Yeah, if it wasn't for him breaking his ankle, now the poor kid has to come out and say, "Oh, I wish I would have broken my ankle sooner." Like that to me is absolute bullshit. I'm not. I'm not going to lie. Like that, the way they handled that is poor. But this is also the same committee that said, huh, "Bo Nix's completion percentage is really good. Oregon's great." Also, like, how can people take this committee seriously when it's run by a guy named Boo Corrigan? Hey, yeah, let's hear what Boo Corrigan's got. It. No, I, well, I, maybe if he said something of value. But the man said that Bo Nix's completion percentage is why Oregon was good. Like that, that, that to me is the inconsistency. They have these people that aren't great with the media, which is fine. That's normal. Not everybody is eloquently, eloquently well spoken or, or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, it, Joe, it goes back to what Joe said it's consistency. There was no consistency in this. At least there is consistency in the BCS. Oh, it's a computer program. This makes sense. Listen. There was no, there was no consistency in 2016. There's no consistency in 2023. Good riddance, 14 playoff. Mike Leach has a great perspective on it from 2017. If you want to go look that up, but the fact of the matter is, Florida State's not in. I do think that Alabama is a better team, and of course, because Texas beat Alabama in week, whatever, they are in there too. So you know there, there should be value in playing better opponents. There should be value in Texas playing Alabama. There should be value in, in maybe a Penn State playing a West Virginia, or a playing or t- Florida State playing LSU. But the issue is that really just doesn't matter anymore. The goal is to finish undefeated. Penn or Michigan was able to do that by playing the little sisters of the poor beginning of the season. Sands Harbaugh, you know, I think he should get coach of the year. Yeah, he was resurrected from the dead to coach in the twice. In the, yeah, right. And to, to <laughs> yeah, well, he actually died. Game. That's great. Like Jim Harbaugh was actually dead, and then he died again, and he came back both times. That's right. And, and listen, you mentioned – somebody mentioned Mizzou as a matchup for Penn State earlier in the podcast. Eli Drinkwitz had a, an absolutely incredible, incredible interview with the ESPN. In the, middle of the, in the middle of the interview, they play Ohio State in their bowl game. And what he says, hold on, that's, 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 uh, that's Connor Stallions calling. He's got some signals for me. And I thought that was absolutely phenomenal television. But – you know, it, it all worked out in the end for Penn State, I think, um, the way that it went. Because if Florida State does make the playoff, that pushes Louisville into the Orange Bowl and and some other things there. That, but Penn State gets to go to the Peach Bowl. They get to go to Hot Atlanta and play in the Mercedes-Benz Superdome. And there's value in that. You know, that's a different experience. They are very well known for for what they do for their student-athletes down in the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. And I think that's a really good spot for them. But, man... The hypocrisy throughout college football is absurd today um, and every day, really, the way that things are going. But it's only just getting started. Ironically, Jim Phillips is one of the main people who uh, delayed the 12-team college football playoff uh, from starting this year. And then he is the first one to rip it to shreds when uh, his team doesn't make it. Um, Florida State, it's you're only as good as your last game. And the committee, it took them nine years to get to the point where you are only as good as your last game because they've they've not followed the rules or the guidelines that they've set of we think it should be the best four teams. But I think Kirk Herbstreet went on the lobby train early and often this year and said, hey, we want the four best teams. And why? Because the semifinal games have been absolute 
dog shit. 2016, when Penn State doesn't make it, Ohio State gets in on over them. They lose 31 to nothing to Clemson. Alabama beat Cincinnati, what, 27 to 6? 27 to 6. Clemson beat Notre Dame 30 to 3. I mean, there's been some lopsided games in the college football semifinal. Um, Alabama beat Michigan State 38 to nothing. Um, there's there's a lot of lopsided games. And finally, it took, it took them 10 years to do it. But finally, we get the best four teams. And I think it's the best way for this to go out. And unfortunately, until college football goes to something like the NFL or the MLB or the NHL or any other big league, where all these teams are intertwined and they start playing each other. And there's a hard and fast criteria for they won their conference. They're automatically in until there is that actual criteria. You are going to be reliant on the eye test. And unfortunately the eye test leads you to being again, you're only as good as your last game. Florida state faltered down against Florida, barely beating a backup quarterback for a five and seven Florida team. And then Jake Plummer at Purdue at, Excuse me, at Louisville fought, came over from Purdue. He couldn't complete a pass, and the only and Florida State is a good run defense, so barely squeaked by Louisville, who doesn't have a competent offense. And unfortunately, they just got caught holding the bag. They they got the short end of the stick, and it is what it is. But I think I think we are in for a good Final Four. I think Texas Washington is two high powered offenses with maybe not the best defenses. That's gonna be a good game. Then you got strength against strength, a movable force versus what'd you say, Joe, earlier? The Irresi- irresistible force for, uh, versus the immovable object. Yeah, that's Michigan's defense versus Alabama's offense. Jalen Milrow is finally catching his stride, and honestly, the growth of Jalen Milrow earlier this from this beginning of the season getting benched uh, to now leading Alabama to an SEC championship. I mean, you want to see that storyline develop, and I think Alabama at the end of the season looked better than Florida State and. When you break your tibia and you're out for 12 months, unfortunately, you can't come back to play. And the committee had to weigh that. And I think it was important to protect the integrity of the semifinal. You need you need close games. Yeah. What, what kind of what kind of sucks about um, the playoff is that I think last year is the best example where like there's always going to be at least one game that is just like catastrophically bad. Like we got two two classic semifinal games. Like arguably the two best what semifinal games ever were both in that playoff, and then it's almost as if the football gods decided to even that out and make the title game sixty-five seven or whatever it was. So like, there's going to be one game that just absolutely stinks. I don't know when it's going to be. I hope that at least one of the semifinal games is kind of like last year's were, where it goes down to the wire, and it's something that we talk about. Um, but uh, the way the football playoff has been. Um, I have my doubts because it seems like no matter what teams are in there, there's just always at least one game that's just either a loser or just embarrassingly lopsided. Yeah, yeah and me, satisfyingly, uh, it. I think you know the ups that the upset that I'm looking forward to that I think is going to be possible. And we'll talk more as, as these games get closer, but I think Alabama, the way that they're playing right now going against Michigan, we all know how Harbaugh is in bowl games at Michigan. I think that would just be incredible. And that's, and that's the other thing that I don't think, you know, many people are, have talked about, right. Harbaugh is back on the sidelines, but at the same time, if the NCAA would have completed their investigation and, and not allowed them to make the playoff, this could have alleviated a lot of stress um, for a lot of different people. And I think there's, you know, there's some merit in that as well. But of course, now it's they still are. Well, they are they still waiting for that bomb to drop, or or things like that. So that I think is going to be interesting to um, to look for as well. But you play the best teams in the country. I think that's the way that that's the play, way a playoff should work. It's sometimes, you know, the most deserving team isn't the best team. And that's just kind of the way that um, the way that things work in, in life. You know, you might be the most deserving of the of the Rays, but you might not be the best person for the Rays. So there's just a lot, um, a lot at stake here. And, you know, it, it, sometimes you got to take one for the team. And the ACC did that. Yeah. And imagine if Alabama didn't play Texas at the beginning of the season 
then there's not that barometric game of Texas beating Alabama so that if you put Alabama in, Texas also has to go in because you couldn't you couldn't repeat 2016 where Penn State doesn't make it and Ohio State does. Like you can't have the head to head loss and still get in above the above the team that you lost to. And let's let's also look. Florida State is not the first conference championship champion to not get in. Three of them last year, Clemson, Utah, Kansas State, Baylor, Utah, Pittsburgh the year before, Oklahoma, Oregon two years before that. There are multiple times where one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times there has been seven of the ten times at least two power five champions have been left out. Florida State is just it's unfortunate. It's sensational at this point in time. And honestly, when they lose to Georgia by like 35, 40 points, probably not going to be that big of a margin. But I mean, it's going to be three or four scores easy for Georgia and Florida State if, as long as Georgia's roster is still mostly intact. Yeah. But like, if, if Georgia gives a shit about the game, yeah. But like, it's we're so not going to have a we're not going to have a UCF. What year was that? Where they claim they're in the national champion? 2019? 18, 18, 19. Yeah, like, we're not going to have a second national champion. No, uh, but if Florida our... finishes undefeated, I bet you they will. They might as well. Everybody in the 1920s and 30s claimed national champions. That's why national championships. That's why Pitt has so many. But we'll I'm see how it goes. Like, I'm I'm not hopeful that Florida State beats Georgia. I I don't. It doesn't matter how pissed. It's not. It doesn't matter how pissed you off you are. Like that team. That team's not going to be able to compete offensively. But the good news is it's bowl season. We have a month to prepare between now and December 30th. The game kicks off at noon on ESPN from the Mercedes from Mercedes Benz Stadium. I keep wanting to say the Mercedes Benz Superdome. It's not. It's not there. That's, that's the under. Sugar Bowl. You know. Also a playoff, and I think that's the other thing too. You know, there there's what could have been was was Washington being the first place team. And then they play in the pack. They play in the um, in the Rose Bowl. Now it's Michigan and Alabama, and then Texas and and Washington. You know, in this in the Sugar Bowl. And I think I think it's a really good semifinal. I think it's going to be a good. There's going to be good games like we talked about. But the rest of the New Year's Six, I think, are are going to be evenly matched as well. You know, OSU gets Missouri, which I think is is a good matchup for them. Um, it'll be very interesting to see. Um, what the Ohio State offense is capable of. Um, I know that they have not done much, um, and they definitely didn't do much against Penn State, or not Penn State, but well, even Penn State, but also Michigan. What And, and now we're going to see what, what type of teams are we looking at? What Who's going to get with um, – who's going to get the best players to play? Like the opt-outs, I think, are going to start hitting hard. Um, but it's going to be – like we said, it's it's just it's the craziness is only beginning. Yeah. And everybody's gonna be talking about Bama and Michigan. I'm guessing that that's if it isn't announced already, that, that's gotta be at a later game, right? Um, I no, would think it's five there, it's five o'clock and they're putting the sugar bowl at eight forty five Eastern. I think it's the dumbest thing ever. Oh, okay. Well, in any case, I think that Michigan and Alabama is gonna be what people are thinking about most because it's Michigan and Alabama, not much explaining needed there. But I'm I think I'm more excited, um, maybe not more excited, but equally excited for uh, Texas and Washington because there's some good stories there. You got two really good quarterbacks in Penix and Ewers. You have, I know it's been more than a decade since they, he coached there, but Sark is coaching against his old team. There's always uh, intrigue there. And perhaps best of all is it guarantees that you're going to get a team in the title game that hasn't been there before. And that's, and that's pretty cool. And I think... It, whatever scenario there is, I think the title game, and you never know because, as I mentioned, the college football playoff always gets stinkers no matter what. But the title game, on the surface, whatever combination there is, it should be pretty solid. And there shouldn't be a repeat of just an out, absolutely overmatched TCU team playing Georgia last season. It, the title game should be pretty good. And there's no threat of an SEC championship game rematch either. Also true. No, and I think it's a really good job um, by the by the committee to to set things up the way that they did. Now it'll be interesting to see how the Fiesta Bowl plays out. You've got Oregon and Liberty. I think that's going to be a disaster. I thought SMU schedule wise, strength of schedule wise, was significantly better than Liberty. But Liberty, Schmiberty, Limu, Emu, whatever you want to say for their for the insurance company. But 
you know, Alabama, Michigan is going to be a good game. Texas, Washington is going to be a good game. But I also think that uh, OSU, Missouri is going to be a good game. So it'll be, I think that's really good. Um, it'll be interesting to see how these bowls go. Um, and and they just the craziness that is the the wording of the bowl games. I think Old Dominion, we talked about Penn State coordinators. They're in the famous Toastery Bowl. Um, I, I, I don't really know what the hell that is. But the Pop Tart will have an edible Pop Tart Bowl will have an edible mascot, whatever the hell that means. Well, you know, Penn State should it, the Peach Bowl could be, easily be an edible mascot. Easily. Oh yeah, well, that's a that's easy money. I don't know why they didn't think of that. It's hard to grow a peach that you can fit a human inside. Ah, oh, they should just try harder. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, we're done. We, I think that's pretty. That's probably the we best way to wrap it. this up. We are trying way too hard. Uh, to keep the show going. So we're just going to stop trying. Um, for Kevin Quigley and Joe Smelter, this has been Jared Prugar on the Lashing Out podcast on the Nittany Sports Down Network. We'll catch you again next week. <laughs>